I um, want to introduce Pepe Willie, who's a musician and founder of Pepe Music Inc. Yeah, he's and, in, and we're going to get more into his life as a musician, specifically in New York and in Minneapolis. Um, he's been a songwriter. He, he has obviously uh, known Prince and St. Little Anthony and the Imperials, and we'll talk about that more. Tony Kenya has been an author. Um, he's written several articles on Prince um, in Minnesota Sound magazines and newspapers over the years. And then Clarence Collins, who was a, a singer who actually wrote the foreword to this book, which I thought was really good, if that's yeah. good, um, was the little Anthony and the Imperials. Um, he's been around for a long time and has still uh, been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall, Hall of Fame and lives in Vegas to this day. Um, this, this program is also live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, and hopefully everybody gets a chance to see this. And also, we're going to record this so people have a chance to capture this later on um, and show it to people and get their friends to watch this uh, later on. Um, sorry about the disconnect. I don't know what happened, um, but I do want to get into this story really and i'm pushing to get into this because there's so much in this book and you know i i know Pepe a long time but i didn't know i didn't know Pepe. let me put it that way you know <laughs> i mean the funny part Pepe, you just kind of appeared on the scene here you know yeah. i remember you know i was like you know Pepe willie no i don't know him because part of the 70s i was in la so i really wasn't here ah, the, bottom, okay. off the whole time you know i yeah. stopped playing in like 75 and right. so you, know, you were just sort of got here and so, and so I still had friends that were here, but you know, you were sort of this mythological character that was moving in the shadows of the music scene here <laughs> for a long time. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, I want to direct it to Tony first. I want to ask you, Tony, what was it about working on a book with Pepe? Well, um, I learned about Pepe. Um, I must've been about 13 years old. And I kind of discovered Pepe and uh, similar to the way I discovered Prince. When I was eight, I had a friend, uh, Prince's first album was out, but you know nobody knew who he was. I had a friend who had an eight track uh, version of his debut album for you. And he'd gotten it as a gift. He didn't, he never listened to it. I just saw it on his, uh, his you know, desk or whatever. And the image just spoke to me. It was like, I said, that, that's the coolest looking guy I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so I traded him for that A-track, took it home. We had a brand new A-track stereo, listened to it. Um, and like Bobby Z said, when he first heard Prince, I, I became a lifer. Yeah. So jump ahead um, past Purple Rain and John Bream, you know, was one of the first to write a book about Prince. And he talked a lot about Pepe. So that's how I, you know, learned, you know, who Pepe was and, you know, somewhat what kind of role he had played. But then maybe uh, another year and a half or so, I'm in my record store in my, you know, local mall. And I see this just like I saw with Prince's album. I see this image of an album. It was a, a vinyl record. It says Minneapolis Genius, 94 East. And it's got the dove with the rose and the purple sky. And I was like, OK, I don't know exactly what that is, <laughs> but I know I'm going to buy it. <laughs> and of course it was Pepe's album, you know, the, the, um, some of the tracks that he had recorded with Prince and Andre Simone and, and so many others back in the seventies. And, uh, I became a fan of Pepe's then. So jump ahead, you know, he, he had more music come out. You'd read about him in magazines like Uptown magazine, which was a big Prince, you know, fanzine out of Europe. Um, so I, I just knew who he was. Um, and I was a fan. So I'm 26 when I finally move here and Prince is doing a benefit at Paisley Park. This was uh, September 97. And I'm just standing in line along Audubon Road waiting to get in at the, at the gate. And I look to the west and I see this uh, BMW, you know, just slowly moving towards, you know, towards me. And I'm not a big car car guy, that's, you know, but um, I just kept my eyes on it for some reason. So the car pulls in to... Uh, tries to get in the parking lot and the security comes and stops him. Right. So Pepe jumps out and walks up to the guy and I'm saying to myself, Oh my God, that's Pepe Willie. That's Pepe Willie. And, uh, you know, nobody else was paying attention, I guess. I don't know how many people were there at the point at the time, but security explained to him that, you know, you, we're not letting people park. You got to park on the street tonight. So as he uh, walks back to his car, I just blurt out, out of nowhere, hey, Pepe, which is not something I would normally do. It just came out. So he walks over to me and he says, where'd I know you from? He puts, you know, puts out his hand. I said, 
You don't, but I know you. <laughs> I thought I played golf with him. That's what I <laughs> right. And uh, we started talking. Um, Marcy was with him that night um, from 94 East. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And we talked about writing this book probably 20 years ago, if not more. And in 2006, 2007, we finally sat down and started to put, you know, words on a page and maybe came up with 80 pages of just stories. And um, I say February, I think February 2016 is when we really got serious and, and jumped back in it. Right, because I remember we only had like 85 pages. At yeah. Birth, I yeah. So, so and, Pepe, what, what made you feel that you had a book in you? I mean, this is, you know, this is, I mean, I've read the book now. I know you had a book in you, but how did you think you had a book in you? Well, you know, I, I didn't really know. Um, um, I, I used to tell these stories about, you know, being around my uncle, you know, Clarence Collins of Little Anthony and Imperials when I was 15. Uh, I went to my first rock and roll show with Little Anthony and Imperials, Chubby Checker, the Coasters, and all of them was on the same show. And I used to tell these stories about, my experience, you know, at these rock and roll shows, you know, and with Murray the K and then the whole Motown review and that whole thing. And somebody had said to me one day, you know, you should write a book. And I was going like, yeah, but I didn't know if I had enough content to write a book or anything like that, you know. And through the years, I kept telling the same stories over and over and over again. I wanted my uncle to write a book mainly, you know, because they went through struggles in their career and we are standing on the shoulders of those artists, you know, that made it good for us to be where we are today, to own our own music, to have, uh, to produce our own music, to write our own music. But uh, um, when Tony came along, what he didn't mention at first is that we played a lot of basketball together. Yeah, and trying to stop his jumper. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided to write a book with him. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I had a hook shot that was unbelievable. Nobody could stop that. Still Nobody, does. Still know? does. <laughs> and uh, so I decided, okay, yeah, we should write a book. But I didn't really know how to start, you know. And uh, Tony came along and he said that I'll help you. So I said, okay, and that's when we started and we got through like 85 pages and then we kind of fell off a little bit and and then we just played basketball and hung out together. He became a real good friend and I knew his family and his daughter and everybody, his wife and his daughter. And uh, one day we just started back up again. Tony used to come over to the house and he started mentioning, yeah, well, what about this book thing and stuff? And then we just started writing. I started recording a lot of the interviews that I was uh, having and uh, and giving Tony the tapes. <laughs> we started when you, writing. When you started this, did you guys come up with sort of a theme? I mean, reading your reading it is really sort of it's not I don't want to say it's 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 tales, but it is definitely a journey through the music industry. When you say, when you talk about six decades, it is really yeah. goes through the process. And so were you guys trying to instill some wisdom? Were, were, what was kind of the structure that you came up with in, in, in designing this book? Either well, one of you. Yeah, you know, um, Tony, you want to answer that? Right. Well, as Pepe mentioned earlier, he wanted to really talk about the struggles and what it meant to come up as an African-American musician in the 50s and the 60s and through through today even and how the lessons he learned as a teenager in in his twenties, how he was able to to share those with Prince and Morris Day and Andre and all the other talents around here in Minneapolis. So that was a that was always a big focus. Yeah. Another part of it was, I mean, Pepe's life before he even gets to to Minneapolis. That to me, that was a book. That was a bestseller itself. <laughs> his life story is tremendous. The things that he went through, the things that he experienced. So. We knew we had something there. We thought we had something there to to you know to work from, and of course, being you know center stage or or you know behind the scenes maybe, but right there when Prince is uh, is starting to make that journey to stardom from well, a teenager. You, you know, one of the things yeah. is that, that 
that you know that he comes to me and anybody who's worked with Prince pretty soon everybody thinks that Prince was the center of your life and you know and I reading your book I really realized it, that there's so much that you were going through Pepe in your life and what you were doing I mean I mean the whole I mean I'm not pulling anything that's on the book I mean you were in a street gang in, in Brooklyn right. and you know uh, have, ha having a periphery in the music industry, you know, with with your uncle and then other groups that you're around. So you kind of are absorbing it. But that's what I liked about the book is it, it isn't centered so much on Prince. Prince is obviously right. a titan in in the life. In your oh book, yeah, but, but, but yeah. So so in in your life, I really want to talk because it's interesting. That the street gang thing is really interesting to me because you, <laughs> obviously you know you get caught up in it to a certain when you're young because you were young. But mm -hmm. sort of what made you sort of get away from that life? Well, you know, um, my father always told me, and I was afraid of my father. My father was like, oh, my God, you know, you know, but uh, he said, I don't ever want to see you in the gang, you know, and, <laughs> and I'm going, all right, Dad, all right. But every day I used to go to this candy store. It was about a half a block from where we lived at this apartment building in Bed-Stuy. And I'd go in the store and you get penny candy and I would just load up the bags and all like that. So then when I came out, it was always these group of guys, you know, just standing there. And they came to beat me up, man, I'm telling you, you know. And uh, there was one guy named Preston who I feared. I mean, he was short, but he was very muscular, but I feared him. And uh, these guys would stop me and they would surround me and I couldn't go home with my bag of candy. And one guy would say to the other guy, you go get Preston, you know. So they had to go and get Preston. And this guy was walking so slow. This guy would walk and every step, when I seen him turn the corner, I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the next step, I cried even more. The next, the closer he got, the more I cried. And, and, they used to beat me up all the time, you know, and then they let me go and I'd go home crying and stuff. And I wouldn't let my father know. Nobody knew. So one day my cousin, Frankie, had came to visit me. He lived not too far from me. And we went to that same candy store and we bought candy. And I'm not even thinking I wasn't even thinking about, uh, you know, these guys are going to come and beat me up or whatever and stuff, you know. And me and Frankie came out of the candy store and those guys were there. And I went like, oh, man. And in my brain, I was going, not today, not today. And then I said it louder and I said it to these guys. I said, hey, not today, guys, not today. And then one guy says, go get Preston. <laughs> and I went like, oh, my God, I would get my butt kicked in front of my cousin and stuff. And he was, you know, my younger cousin. So Preston comes from around the corner and he gets up to me and I wasn't crying this time. And he hits me, boom, right in the chest. And I go like, oh man. And I said, man, please. I said, don't hit me no more, man. Don't you hit me no more. And he hit me again, boom. And I said, oh man. And at that moment, I t balled up my fist and I hit him dead in his stomach. And then I hit him with a left in his stomach. Then I hit him another left, right in the stomach, and another left in the stomach. And he, he was so out of wind, he started bending down, like going down. And then I hit him on the top of his head. Boom, you know, and he went down, and I started running. <laughs> I, I had sent my cousin home. I, I had said, Frankie, you know, go ahead to the house. He, he had left already, and they were just starting with me. So I beat Preston. I beat this guy down, and I started running down the block. And all of these guys were chasing me. And then I seen my mother, and my mother and father were separated, you know, so I didn't really know my mother that well because I lived with my dad. And I seen my mother and I ran to her and I kind of grabbed her and stuff. And my mother said, oh, no, oh, no, you ain't going to beat up my son today. He's going to whoop you guys one at a time, one at a time. And I looked at her <laughs> I had to fight all of these guys. <laughs> you know, and uh, so they just looked at me and they walked away and Preston was really hurt, you know. So then the next day I was walking to the candy store and I seen Preston. And he was walking across the street, going the opposite way. And I was walking across the street and I looked at him and I was shaking my head and I go like, yeah, 
Yeah, you want some more? You want some more? I started getting tough then. And then the gang approached me a couple of weeks later and made me war counselor of the gang. The gang was called the Stone Killers. And they made me war counselor. So then, you know, I had to stay in the gang to survive and stuff, you know. And we fought other gangs like Fort Green Chaplains, where my uncle <laughs> lived in Fort Green Projects, you know. So I couldn't even go see him because we were fighting those guys and stuff and the Corsair Lords and Cross Park Chaplains. I mean, all of these gangs that we were fighting. So when I um, was 15, this is about two years later, I was 15. And uh, my uncle was doing a show at the Paramount Theater right across from Junior's Delicatessen. And he asked me to come. So and I went and I seen the show and I was like, oh, man, this is what I need to do. This is what I wanted to do. So that helped draw me away from the gang life, you know, more into music. And that following year, we went over to the Brooklyn Fox Theater where Murray Decay was doing his shows at, and the whole Motown review was there, including uh, uh, Dion Warwick, Patti LaBelle, you know, Marvin Gaye, you know, all these people, uh, Ray Charles and all this. And I was a little hustler. I was going to the store for these people and uh, making, you know, a few dollars and stuff. Always had $100 in my pocket at 16. And when I seen all of these groups together, black and white singing and stuff, and the only thing that they uh, were competitive about was on stage. You know, the Imperials would say, we're going to kick the Four Tops butt, man, on this show. We're going to drive. We're going to beat the Temptations down. They're going to be sorry that they even seen us <laughs> on the stage. You know, and, and I used to go to the Four Tops room and say, well, what color uniforms you guys are wearing and they said well we're wearing black then i've run back up to the dressing room of the imperials i said the tops are wearing black and then sammy would go okay we're going to kill them with the whites man we're going to kill them we're going to wear white and so and uh, and they did i mean you know uh little anthony imperials always closed the show because there was no act that could follow them i mean they did dancing they did splits they did all of this stuff and at the end of the shows all of these artists white, black, Timmy Euro, I mean, Righteous Brothers, and they would all stand in the hallways singing gospel songs. And I looked at this and how people got along, and I went like, wow. I said, this is what I want to do in life. This is what I wanted. It's like the power of music to, to bring people together. I mean, music is the universal language, and it uh, definitely yeah. you get beyond that. So there was obviously something about music that tapped into your soul. Where did you start to see yourself, you personally, Pepe, in, in, in this? What was your dream? What was your goal for yourself in the music world? Well, I didn't know how to play an instrument. That's first. You know, the only thing I knew how to play was drums. Uh, in school, I was uh, in the music class as a drummer. So we were reading and writing drums, you know, and uh, that was fun. But I that, that is an instrument, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't write songs with it, no chords, you know what I mean? I, you know, uh, um, so and I, after I got kicked out of music class, <laughs> <laughs> and they sent me to art because I was clowning and stuff. I knew nothing about art, you know, and uh, uh, I remember one day at the Brooklyn Paramount, Brooklyn Fox Theater, a uh, producer came up, his name was Teddy Randazzo. And uh, he had a song for the Imperials because their last hit was like Shimmy Shimmy Coco Bop or something. And Teddy came up and he wrote this song called I'm on the Outside Looking In. And they pulled one of the uh, uh, band members, a guitar player named Eric Gale to come in and play the song. And right there in the dressing room, they had came up with harmonies they were singing the lyrics and everything and and they were taping it on these little tape recorders and and i i just was amazed at how all of this came up you know together so i started because i didn't know how to play a guitar or a keyboard or anything like that i started writing lyrics you know and i had this notebook and I would just write things that came in my mind, uh, things that I had experienced. And uh, and I would take them to Teddy Randazzo, you know, and I said, Teddy, Teddy, look at this. He was a wonderful guy, very, very friendly. And he would take take my lyrics 
and rip it apart. <laughs> I was almost in tears, man. He's going scratching this out, scratching that out, scratching this out and that, that. And I was going like, oh, man, you know. So the next time I came back, he I showed him some lyrics of some different stuff I was doing. And he was scratching out less and less and less. And then I learned the lesson of what to use in lyrics, how to write songs and things like that. And one of the songs that I wrote was called My Mind is Open, you know? And uh, my uncle and Anthony produced that song for the Blues Busters. They were out of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I went to the recording studio when they were recording my song. And it was great, you know, and they sang it good. They sang it great. I don't know if it ever was released or anything like that. But uh, um, while they were producing it, I was thinking, you know, I would do something different. You know, I, I would I would do this different. I wouldn't do it like that. There were certain things that I didn't like about it. And then I started uh, going to all their recording sessions with Teddy and stuff. And when they did Gone Out of My Head and Hurt So Bad, uh, Take Me Back. And, and I remember when we did Take Me Back, they had a full orchestra, strings and French horns and trombones and, you know, all the uh, rhythm section and everything. And Teddy came up to me and this is like three or four o'clock in the morning. And he would say, I want you to conduct, you know, the orchestra. And I went like, Oh, wow. So he gave me this little baton and I'm going like, then I I didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing this. But you look good doing it. You know, the musicians were smiling and everything and I'm just going like this, just keeping time, you know. And that's how I learned. I I started learning that. And then uh, I bought this guitar for like $15, you know, from the pawn shop. And I bought this rock chord guitar. Uh, a, a book and I started learning these bar chords and stuff. And I started, you know, playing that and, and learning that. And then I went to uh later on, I went to Brooklyn conservatory of music and learning jazz chords and stuff like that. That's when I started writing songs. And that's when I wrote, if you see me and better than you think, and uh, uh, no, not better than you think, if you see me, if we don't, and I'll always love you, you know, I started writing songs then. Yeah, that's great. That's and, and that, again. They, it's interesting because you see how you, the pieces are put together in your life. So you know, you, you yeah. I mean, part of being in the music industry and surviving the music, music industry, you have to have a certain lo- level of strength, but you also have to love music. Right, I had really, to love yeah. that music, yeah. but then I always had to go back home, mm-hmm. and then so I was in between gang fighting mm-hmm. and music. Gang well, and, well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying because the yeah. music industry is a gang fight. You you know that, <laughs> and, and part of what you brought to to when you came to the to the Twin Cities, because you, you came here. You, I mean, obviously you came based on a relationship, but you right. came here bringing something that that hadn't been here. I mean, this town has had a musical background forever. You know, the, right, the, yeah. the Rifkins and you know, the, uh, you know, there was musicians that. Got yeah, Bob success. Dylan, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bob, yeah. Michael, you know, uh, they, mm-hmm. but they left. John Denver, you know, they would all right, leave. Right. You know, the Gypsy went to L.A., Hayes yeah. went to L.A., but you came here with a certain level of professional knowledge about the music industry, which definitely helped. Uh, I think a lot of the groups that were here when you came, because you had a perspective that was a little different than what's just organic, and I think it also kept people here. You right. built up something, so as a as sort of as the you know the, the sort of the title as the godfather of of, of the music scene. I don't scene know here. where that came I, from. I don't either, but I'm using it because it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, is it, you brought something to it where people could say, okay, because I, I mean, I, I really got to know you through Prince, you know, yeah. and because everybody would say, you know, I got that Peppy was doing this or I got that from Peppy and, and I grew up with Steve and Rifkin. So, yeah. you know, I knew your name from Bobby and Steven and David ultimately. So, you know, it was kind of that process. So you were there on the scene. I, I wanted to, I, I want to talk a little bit because everybody wants to know kind of your n- first initial meeting with Prince, which is you know legendary. But I want you to relate <laughs> that you know because it's, it is important. I mean, it is it's one of those those divine things that were supposed to happen. Right. Yeah. Well, I got out of the army in 1970, but <clears throat> before that, I had I was in uh, my uncle's group, Little Anthony Imperials. I always go back to these guys. Uh, they were playing at the world famous Copacabana. And uh, one day, Sammy came up, uh, he, Sammy Strain, the, one of the Imperials, 
came up to the dressing room after the show and I was giving them towels so they can wipe the sweat off and taking their uniforms and hanging them up, you know, just valet stuff. And uh, Sammy came into the dressing room and he came, he says, Peppy. And I said, yes. He goes like, who's that girl out there with the green eyes? And I don't know what made me say this, but I said, oh, that's my girl, man. That's my girl. So I knew that he would leave her alone, you know, and I knew he had good taste in girls. So I knew that she would be pretty, you know. So after I finished hanging up his uniform, the other guys were still, you know, out signing autographs. And uh, so now I had to go into the waiting room amongst all of these women and find this girl with the green eyes. You know, so I'm looking around and I'm looking around and people looking at me and I seen this girl and I looked at her. She looked at me and I said, oh, green eyes. I said, that's her. And I went and I sat down next to her and I said, hello, my name is Pepe. And she says, hi, my name is Chantel. And I says, um, how are you here? I don't know what this is. And I said, how, how, you know, uh, why are you here? You know, who do you come to see? And uh, she says, well, I came to see my aunt Kalua. And I says, oh, OK. I said, well, Kalua is dating my uncle. So I asked her if she can hang out and act if she had a curfew. That was a line from you know, New York. So. Uh, yeah, baby, uh, you got a curfew or something? No, I don't have no curfew, you know. And I said, OK, good. We can hang out. And that would happen to be Prince's first cousin, you know. So I think that things that you say can change your life. And just by me saying that that was my girl had changed my whole life. So I met her, we fell in love. I got drafted, went into the army. I got out in 1970. And then when I got out, instead of me going back home to Brooklyn, I came to Minneapolis to see my girl. And I got a room at the uh, Radisson, you know, downtown. And I called her up, she came over, hung out for a while. And then she took me over to uh, um, her aunt's house, you know, and I seen Prince for the first time. He was 12 years old. I thought he was eight because he's. <laughs> I thought he was eight wrestling around, wrestling with his cousin Charles. And I didn't really pay him no mind. I just came there to see my girl. So I had three months to get back to New York to, uh, uh, to um, uh, keep my job with the New York telephone company. I was a cable splicer. So I went back to New York and then I, I called Chantel up and I asked her to marry me and stuff. And then we got married and stuff. And, and uh, then I came back to Minnesota in 1974. You know, uh, my father-in-law, uh, Eddie Mandeville, uh, was doing a ski party. And I didn't know anything about skiing, you know, from Brooklyn. You know, what do we know about skiing, you know? So the band that was playing at the party after we got finished skiing was Grand Central. So now what I heard, <laughs> they had thought, oh, yeah, some big time producers coming from New York to see you guys. You know, I didn't know it was me, you know. <laughs> I just came for the party and stuff, you know, have a good time. So, and, and Mars's mother, LaVon, kept looking at me and stuff, waiting for me to say something to her. And I, I didn't know what to do, you know. And I, I said, well, Pepe, you got to do something. You got to, okay, you know, Prince and those guys were playing Earth, Wind, and Fire tunes and stuff. And I, so I went over to her table. She was sitting by herself. And I said, you know, I really like this group. And she says, oh, yeah, really? And I said, yeah. I said, I would like to work with these guys. And she says, okay, we'll set up rehearsals and all of this stuff. And we that's how it all started. And I started working with Grand Central. And uh, uh, I told them to play one of their songs. And uh, uh, Andre had You Remind Me of Me. Prince had this song called Sex Machine. And, uh, you know, so, you know, they was playing it. And I, I couldn't hear the lyrics. I was going like, well, what? something sounds not right. And... Uh, and I said, um, Andre, can you write the name? There was a blackboard in the attic. I said, can you write the lyrics on the blackboard? So he wrote the lyrics on the blackboard. And the rest of the group was going like, 
Oh, so that's what you're saying? You know, so they, they didn't even know. That plus, the songs were lasting like five, ten minutes. I mean, they were so long. And I gave them this formula of how to write three minute, three minute, 30 second song, because that's what radio was playing at that time. That's all the time that you had, you know, and uh, I worked with them well. And I didn't know that Prince played several instruments until one, one day at rehearsal, he went up to Linda and uh, uh, Linda Anderson, Andre's sister, and she was playing keyboards and he went over to her and he says, this is what I want you to play. And he started playing these keys. And I was like this, I was going like, wow, man, this guy plays keyboards and stuff. All right, okay. Then he started playing the bass and I went like, oh my God, this guy plays bass too. So I asked him one day, you know, this is after a few weeks or a month or so. I said, have you ever been in a recording studio before? Because I was in the studio recording with 94 East. And uh, he said, no. And I says, well, I want you to play guitar for me with my group. I'm in the studio and stuff. So I gave him a tape of uh, five songs. I said, learn your parts and stuff. And uh, we'll, our book time in the studio, we'll go back and, and do it. And he learned all his parts. We went in the studio. I booked four hours and we did five songs in four hours. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing. I know in, in the context of, of when you came, I know Prince was the first one. Did you plan on sort of becoming, uh, bringing your music career here to the Twin Cities based on the music that was here? What was it about that insp inspiration that no, Neoff was brought? It, it wasn't. I think that Grand Central gave me my, my insight of staying here in Minnesota, you know, because uh, my friends would call me up from Brooklyn. They was going like, yo, man, you know, how you doing in Minneapolis? They couldn't even say it, you know. <laughs> and uh, any brothers out there in Minnesota and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going like, yeah, you know. And I said, but the radio station went off when the sun went down, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what was that, K K uh, KGLH? KUXL or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's the one that went down. Yeah. It was yeah. a sun station. It was only on when the sun was up. Right. Only so that's where they got their power from. Yeah. So they asked me, was I coming back? And I said, man, let me tell you something. I said, there's some great musicians here. You know, I said, I'm going to make this the, the, the next Motown. That's what I thought. I said, I'm going to make this the next Motown. So I stayed, you know, and just started working musically. You know? Yeah. No, that's great. And I'm glad you did. And, I, you know, you yeah. now are part of Minnesota history, which yeah. I think is great to hear this, that the Historic Society has put together this book sort of radiating you. you. Um, yeah. uh, I know there's probably some questions out there. I want to kind of open it up for other people, too. Um, yeah, okay. If you have any questions, please direct them to us because we're definitely open to it. It's not just, you know, um, me talking and asking yeah. questions. I, I, it, one, of the, one other question is that, that knowing Tony no you know, kind of some of the history, because you, you actually know more about this Minnesota music scene than you're letting on right now. I know that for a fact. So I just want to, your, your take on the Minnesota music scene, because you you came to it musically too, just like Pepe did. You came to this environment. What, what were your, your feeling? Well, when I was a teenager, I mean, I wanted to be in Prince's band. That was my, <laughs> that was my life goal. Okay. I was, I was going to, you know, and I, I, I mean, what were you going to play? A guitar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I tried. Uh, my daughter's got that. She's got the talent in the family musically. Um, she, she she plays several instruments, yeah. but uh, that was my goal. I realized, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get there. <laughs> I'm just, I just don't have it. But uh, when I was in, in school and college, um, this was in the early nineties, people started to write, about music, popular culture became something in the academy that people were interested in. And with Prince, it just it just wasn't. I mean, there was so much there, politics, spiritual things. I mean, he just covered the whole gambit. I just and, he, you know, he's my idol growing up. So I was like, I realized I could write about Prince and I was going, my, my plan was to get, you know, get a Ph.D. And my dissertation was either going to be about Prince or, or Fred Hampton. <laughs> um, and I hadn't decided yet, but um, things happen in life. And I, I took leave from school and moved here. Um, I always felt I'd end up here because I wanted to, you know, even when I realized I'm not going to play in Prince's band. Um, 
I just wanted to be here, be part of this world and, and see it. And the fact that I met Pepe um, 10 days after I'd moved here, I mean, like Pepe said, you know, words change your life. When I said, hey, Pepe, yeah, it's 99 times out of 100. I would have never said that. Yeah. That, that yeah. changed my life. And um, just, you know, the Minneapolis sound, I mean, that that could have been is to me artistically, it, it, it is is, you know, as as strong and powerful as Motown. Yeah. Um, commercially, you know, for a lot of reasons, some, you know, um, I won't get into those, but, you know, it didn't didn't develop that way. But it's still like um, it's just a musical phenomenon that I grew up with. Yeah. And um, and just everything that, uh, you know, I got out of the music, not just Prince, but the time and it, all the all, there's so much talent that was here, which yeah. it seems, you know, seems almost like a miracle that, yeah. that this yeah. much talent emerged from one one city, yeah. particularly when you consider, you know, in the black music world, I mean, Minneapolis, when Prince was growing up, what, three for four percent African-American, mm-hmm. if that. And just, the you know, it's just um, something in the water, I guess, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy and I, I mean, I mean, Jimmy and I were talking, Jimmy Jam and I were talking about this once and, and that part of what growing up here in this town, because there was such a small African-American population in the Twin Cities, I should say, Minneapolis and St. Paul, but also what it was is you you had to listen to all music. You, I mean, right. polka, I mean, there was polka yeah. shows were on TV. You watched them because that was all that was on. You know, mm-hmm. you ended up watching country Western music because that's what was on. Porter Wagner and the Wagon Masters and Dolly Parton was the backup singer. Yeah. I remember those shows. <laughs> but, you know, we didn't have, we had a black radio station only on periodically. So you listen, right. so you, you'd go to a black party and there would be James Brown and the James Gang. You, you, you grew <laughs> yeah. up that. So you, you created this different palette that I think than, than in other places in, in, in America anyways. And I think you started to accept and then it infused you. And I, that's kind of what it was. So I want to open this up for questions. If there's any questions out there, just send them to me so we can ask them. Um, I think there might be a few backed up, you know. Yeah, so Pepe, who did, who did you see before you hit that that you knew you were going to get be huge? So who did? I'm huge? <laughs> Who did you know before they were going to be huge? You know, how did you? How did you? Um, what like what artists? Yeah. Who did, you yeah not, they, not who did you see before the? Who did you see before they hit that you knew were going to be huge? Oh. Besides friends, who did you know? Well, Wayne Newton. <laughs> yeah, that, and, that was, that's good. You know, <laughs> yeah, I thought yeah. he was gonna be huge because he was doing Don Shane, darling Don Shane, and I was going like, wow, he was on the shows, and I was going like, wow, I don't know how long this guy is gonna be in the business, <laughs> you know. And but I, you know, it's hard to tell who's gonna be big or not because, you know, I know a lot of people say that uh, who worked with Prince and saying, I knew that he was going to be huge. I knew that he was going to be a star. And I don't think anybody really knows because this business is so fickle, you know, and anything can happen, you know. So, you know, I just wanted Prince to get a good start. You know, I, I knew what it was in order to, I, uh, to become successful. And I knew how hard it was for a new artist to break. And I just wanted him to get on his way and to be successful. I didn't know that he was going to be as huge as he was, you know, but I just wanted him to be successful. Yeah. Um, uh, other groups, um, uh, you know, that, that I seen, you know, they were already hit stars, you know, like the Temptations, Mary Wells, the Miracles, the Martha and the Vandellas, the Marvelettes, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, so, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you, I think what you're saying is that, that you don't, I mean, I remember seeing Ike and Tina Turner at the Nakarima. You, yeah. I mean, you didn't know they were, you, they were yeah. good. You but know. You, yeah, you don't, can't tell. I mean, it's, I, you can only wish them the best. And I think that's what it's you hard. did. I, I, and Andre, I think is incredibly talented. Andre and, and, is and, totally incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think he's kind of, it's not, you know, it's not nobody's fault, but I think that, that people don't, He's going to be recognized as he grows 
into himself i think i think people are right. gonna, you know i think he was overshadowed by by prince for a long time just because yeah. of the relationship and because well i think that he quit too soon mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i always uh when the revolution was uh rehearsing at my house for like 12 hours a day for a few months uh, i think it was four or five six months or something like that and uh um i I always had a talk with these guys, you know, always, you know, I, I always said you have to protect Prince because he's the one that signed with Warner Brothers. So if some jealous husband because their wife loves Prince or <laughs> some boyfriend want to beat Prince up, I said, you guys can't sit there and go like, oh, man, Prince got his butt kicked, you know, <laughs> you know, you got to help him, you know, you got to be there. And <clears throat> as long as you stay with him, then you can write your own ticket once he becomes bigger you can write your own ticket and move on you can walk into any record label and get you a deal but i thought that andre quit too soon i think he should have stayed you know for you know at least three to five more years and then he could have went out on his own even though i liked his first album that he did with sony or Columbia, you know, I, I like that first album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I thought the stuff he did even, that he produced, the songs he produced, and, you know, he did a good job. We, uh, yeah, any we more questions out there? Uh, yeah, Jody Watley, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, here's one question here from Anova. Uh, who did you miss working with and why? Oh, wow. Well, who did I miss working with? Well, I would have loved to work with Alexander O'Neill. I could have I could have made that happen. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you should have told me. I didn't. But, uh, I would have loved to work yeah. with him, and uh, I did work with Morris a little bit when he left uh, uh, the time and stuff, you know. But it was on a, a different capacity, you know, building his team. I built his uh, his whole team together with his management, Sandy Gallen, and. David Braun is a lawyer and uh, his accountant uh, so that he can, you know, get started, you know, as a solo career. Um, but uh, I would have loved to work. Oh, there was, there was, um, I was in Las Vegas and Destiny Child was playing in Las Vegas. And I wanted to work with these girls so bad. You know, so I missed that. I missed that. And that's because I never went up to him and says, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got a curfew? <laughs> you know, yeah, right. You got a curfew. You know. <laughs> Other questions out there, people? Uh, what was your most memorable ex experience of all times? Well, uh, there's there's got to be two of them. And uh, one of them is... Um, 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 being on the shows with little Anthony and the Imperials, you know, and then working with Prince, you know, working with Prince, you know, in his younger days was like awesome, you know, because everything that I asked of him, he did. He never questioned anything that I said, except for maybe one time. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, Prince is very uh, memorable to me because of the success that he became and he he never stopped you know he never stopped i i remember him rehearsing at, at our home in in south minneapolis and they rehearsed for like 12 hours a day and then i you know i i went to his house one day to to get him something or, or talk to him about something and i couldn't get in because i um ringing the doorbell banging on the door and 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 I knew he was home because the Dotson 310 was sitting <laughs> sitting outside. And then I, I listened and I heard this little tapping. And I said, man, what is that? I went around the side of the house and I looked down in, in the basement window and he was down there practicing drums after 12 hours of rehearsing. And I'm going like, well, well, you know, how can this guy do this? You know, I mean, he was determined and it was so great to work with him because he was so determined. I knew that he did not want to fail. You know, he didn't want to go be a bag boy at Cub Foods or anything like that <laughs> or Red Owl or whatever, you know, and I even myself, I tried to emulate his work ethics. 
And I I got to like four hours on my guitar, just playing my guitar for four hours, man. And I go on like, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. That was me. <laughs> you know, I can't do it. I mean, he had this drive that was just something I've never seen before. And I've been in this business for a long time. I've seen a lot of groups. I've you know I've seen artists. I you know writers, producers, and and. I've never seen anybody who worked like he did. Yeah, he, he was amazing. I think that's, I mean, one time he and I were talking and I told him we should actually do, this is, I said, we should do a videotape about how you work. Cause I think that yeah. people would benefit from, I mean, yes, he's a star. He was a superstar, whatever, but he, even in his superstar status, he still worked he like there was worked. like no, no tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you just like, he would, I remember one time we were we, we were finishing up Graffiti Bridge and we had been up for like three days because we were then we had flown to LA and it was just it, and I was he was talking to me and all of a sudden he nodded off and it was like for me it's like he he, just, he literally just in the middle of a conversation he just passed out <laughs> worked till he just couldn't, he couldn't you know but that's what he would do it's just it, the total focus on improving yourself and whatever you're yeah. doing you know Absolutely. it's just it's just a, a, amazing and it would be an inspiration to people not just the fact that he was a good songwriter and all that stuff but the fact that he worked at it, it it's yeah. not just something that was given to him it was pure, right. pure hard work you know yeah. um any other questions out there by the audience anybody else a oh, question um what is tony's writing background wow well again i i never set out to be a writer um my father was a, a you know very articulate um both or you know written word and and speaking he was a, you know he taught speech in addition to history and uh i never had that that ability i never felt comfortable in that in that role and i really didn't think about writing until i got like i said i got to college and i uh, had professed you know when i i realized i could write about prince and things you know popular music popular culture um, I had, you know, professors that, uh, I had a professor in particular, um, Floyd W. Hayes III, you know, one of my mentors. Um, I'd write, I remember taking a class with him and I was getting A's in other classes. I, I turned a paper to him, I got a C. <laughs> and I'm, and I, I couldn't believe it, right? And um, he always talked about how, you know, high school never prepared kids to, to write, you know, we're not taught how to write or think critically. And um, I, I wanted to do better, so I, I kept going. And he he'd raise the bar, and I, I'd get a little better. And he kept raising the bar, and that's how you know writing be, kind of became my thing. I don't know that I'm particularly good at it even today. Oh, you I mean, But it's uh, I've I've made a living at it. I mean, it's always what I've done. I've been in the nonprofit world, um, largely as a writer. But the the music stuff and the print stuff that I've done, that's all just been. Uh, labor of love um even th even this book you know we weren't trying to set out to make any money <laughs> we just wanted to tell pepe's story and uh i have to give you know, credit to dr hayes you know without him um i never would have you know followed this path and even though i didn't you know continue to pursue my doctorate i i found a you know i found a place to land and um live out my passions and, and, you know, write about them. And so yeah. I'm well, blessed. I, I think, I think you got, you got, you have a book here. I mean, you yeah. have a book here. You really do. And you having read it, you know, uh, don't put yourself down. I encourage right. everybody to purchase this, you know, um, this book either from the Minnesota Historical Society or from any of the bookstores. You can probably get it um, from uh, your local bookstore, probably from Amazon at some point in time, but it's a good book. This is a subject that I want to talk about because it's, people who knew Prince um, have a different perspective about his passing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it because, and, I've, and I have no idea why it feels that way. It is almost like part of your blood relative past. It's not just sadness. It's, 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 you said it in your book and in in a, you will sometimes be doing normal stuff and all of a sudden this incredible wave of sadness about him being gone will hit you and you will start to cry. It happens to me, it happens to a lot of people yeah. that have worked with him. Uh, can you describe that feeling, Pepe, about what I'm talking about? Well, it, it, to me, it was like losing my brother, my little brother, 
you know, and it was very difficult for me. I, I, I couldn't believe, you know, that this had happened to him because me and his cousin, Charles, we call him Chaz, yes. we, we used to, uh, after basketball, we used to go to my house and, and sit down and talk and we used to have jokes about Prince, you know, can you imagine Prince at 50 with a pot belly singing soft and wet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and we talked about, well, he made it past 27, you know, uh, Janis Joplin and uh, uh, Jimmy Jim Hendrix and, you know, that type of thing. Jim and so we thought that he, he was going to be here with us forever, man. You know, I, you know, I mean, I know people got to die, but we didn't think that, that would happen to him. And when my daughter, uh, the, first of all, the um, incident in Illinois is where he had to get off the plane and go to the doctor and all this. And then uh, uh, my daughter called me and and said, Dad, I go like, yeah, what's up, baby? She goes, uh, did Prince die? And I went like, Prince die? Are you, are you kidding me? No, I, I, I thought he had the flu, you know, he, he was sick. And then Christy heard me and she was looking up online and stuff. And she said, oh, no, it's a hoax. It's a hoax. You know, and I said, "Nah, he ain't. And I said, why did you say this? She said, well, a friend of hers who worked at Paisley Park had said that Prince died. And I went like, oh, no, nah, he ain't dead. And I was getting ready to go golfing and stuff. And then Owen called me and Owen Husney, Prince's first manager, and said, did you hear what happened? And I'm going like, what are you talking about? He says, turn on your TV. And I turned on my TV and found out that he he really did die. And it was in shock. Christy was crying. I was crying. Marcy was crying, you know, and and it was totally unbelievable. I did not believe it. And uh, I was in my car, got in my car and started driving and stuff. And I would just yell his name that maybe he would come back to life or something. I, you know, I was screaming his name, you know, in my car. And it was just I, I just could not believe it. And uh, I was in Florida also one day and uh, playing golf out there. And um, I had the radio on and one of his songs came on and I had to pull over and I was just weeping, man, just so, so bad. Uh, I just, I, it, it, I couldn't even listen to his music and stuff, you know, and it was so, just very, very sad. Yeah. Can, can hey, I Tony. Yeah, 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 Tony, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say, and uh, with regards to what Pepe just said, I think we sat down again to really focus on the book February of that year. Right. And we, we got some momentum. And I think by April, we had five or six chapters done. And we just felt like we're, you know, this is, we can do this. Right. And, and Prince dies. Yeah, I wanted to finish it. I wanted us to finish it before he died. Well, we didn't know he was going to die. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, when he did, you know, we just, our moment, we just stopped. We just shut down for four or five months. We couldn't even touch, you know, I never worked for Prince, but that's, that's, you know, my hero. That's, you know, from eight to I was 45 when he died. Um, it just, it just, it, and it wasn't, it's not just people that work with him. Like you said, Craig, it was just fans all over the world. I mean, the world literally yeah. right. shut down yeah. Yeah. when he died. And uh, it took a lot of us a, a long while to even function after that. Exactly. All right, any more questions? A couple questions more we have coming up here. Uh, uh, Pepe, off the top of your head, what are some of your, your three favorite Prince songs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked his real early stuff because he was really funky and stuff like that. So I liked I Feel For You. You know, I liked uh, um, um, I Want To Be A Lover. You know, uh, the songs that that made it happen for him. And I also liked Purple Rain. You know, those are my top songs that I like. Yeah, that's good. Though. Tony, you got a song? What's that? You favorite three, songs? Three, yeah, three favorite songs. I, I couldn't do it. Um, I, <laughs> I write the Prince. This is I not write, a test. You can say any songs you want to. I know that, but I just give you uh, the the spokesman recorder who I write a Prince column for, they asked me, they said, why don't you write your 10 favorite Prince songs? Yeah. And I said, no, I can't, you know, I just can't, I can't rank them. There's so many. Yeah. Um, I, just, they, you know. 
I just think it was, you know, 17 days is one of my favorites. Oh, that's you know, I, I, yeah, it's, yeah. There's so many gems yeah. like that yeah. that mm -hmm. are not, yeah. you know, people yeah. don't know about yeah. other than yeah. hardcore fans. Yeah. But yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't pick. <laughs> many. Another question out there before we wrap up here? I also, I also like do yourself a favor. <laughs> 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 have all the 94 e sessions been released uh, yeah yeah absolutely yeah, good. yeah. That's good i mean that's that's great too i mean you know because you know I, when you hear prince's early stuff you start to you hear the sort of the the seeds of what ultimately is going to grow into this incredible not even a, a tree but really into I mean, he created a forest actually if you think about all the people that kind of come out of him and you know, he did do that he created a forest and you know when you talk to people i don't care if it's terry and jimmy or jesse or morris or or you know any of these people um that were even in any of the bands i mean he, he did this he yeah. did this yeah and like you said earlier about uh, uh, the radio here. When the radio went off, you had to listen to country western. You had yeah. to listen to rock and roll. You had to mm -hmm. do all. That. Mm -hmm. And Prince listened to all that stuff. He was well rounded in music. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, well, yeah. yeah, He did. He can play. And but uh, but he did create something because happy you wouldn't be you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't. I came back here to work on Purple Rain the movie because I was you know not living here when he when they made that film. I came back as assistant director, and I wouldn't I had no plans on staying. You know, he just that he said, "Okay, you're here. Let's do this." You know, for the rest <laughs> well, of your natural life. But you know. <laughs> Prince called me up when they were doing Purple Rain, mm -hmm. and he says, "I got a part for you in Purple Rain." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Oh, really?" He goes, "Like, yeah." He said, "You're going to play the club owner." Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I said, "All right, cool." I took it all nonchalant. Mm -hmm. And then, then he never called me back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. to, be per to be perfectly honest, the part you know, he was didn't understand how films were made. He was yeah. again, he didn't, I mean, he, what did he know about features? So, so there's a machine that came in, you know, uh, that sort of took over because that's how I got it. I mean, I because I'm a, a assistant director in DGA, mm -hmm. so they need it. So I got a call. Like, he wasn't him. I got a call from the producers, and it just kind of rolled that way. So it wasn't personal. It was just the process. I had to go and audition on my. <laughs> As an actor, yeah. mm -hmm. that got it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And they cut my scene out too. It was me and Morris Day. Yep. We were supposed to have been at a club, and mm -hmm. this guy was juggling knives and a saw, uh, a chainsaw, and you know, <laughs> and hatchet. He was mm -hmm. trying, to, and he was dropping them all on the floor and stuff. So me and Morris were his laughing and my laugh. You know, mm -hmm. it was great, but it didn't make the cut. You know. No, he just. Any, another question out there? We got one more question here. For me. Um, pretty, pretty please, uh, Sarah Blues. Uh, what uh, what version do you like better, Jesse Johnson's release of Prince demo, uh, "If You See Me," or "Do Yourself wow. a Favor"? Is it is that the, is the same titles? The same song because oh, yeah, yeah. it was originally called "If You See Me," and then Prince recorded it in the eighties, called it oh. "Do Yourself a Favor." Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Morris and I were hanging out, and uh, we was in his uh, Mustang, and <laughs> we was riding around in Minneapolis, and we ran into Prince, and we didn't want to run into him, you know, because Prince, you know, don't get me wrong, he was a great musician and all like that, but he was square. Prince was a square. <laughs> all he wanted to do was practice and play and stuff. We wanted to hang out and have fun, so we ran into Prince and. You know, he comes running over to the car. You know, what are you guys doing? And we went like, nothing, you know. <laughs> we just wanted them to leave. Get out of here, man. You know? And he gives us this cassette, and Morris puts it in his in his uh, 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 car and stereo, and it was Do Yourself a Favor. And I was going like, wow. And it was a different version from mine. It was upbeat and, you know, and Prince did his thing to it. And it was great. And I loved it, you know. So Prince said he was going to put it out on one of his albums, but he never did. And it wound up in the vault. So when I um, was in New York doing Minneapolis Genius, Jesse had heard Prince's version. And he called me up in New York. And he says, I want to do that because he would just got signed with A&M, second album he was doing. And, um, I said, go ahead and do it, man, because Prince ain't going to do it. Just go ahead and do it, you know. So Jesse did it, and I liked his version, but ultimately, 
I love Prince's version. I love it. I love how he did it. And I love how he just took it. He just took it and made it his own. Yeah. That's good. Well, that's the title of the book. If I see. If you yeah. see me. If you see me, this is it, Pepe Willie and Tony. I want to appreciate you guys for coming here. I can I want to thank you for doing this. Also, the Minnesota Historical Society Press is where the book comes from. If you uh, they sold at the bookstore at the Minnesota Historical Society, so you can get it there. Hopefully when Electric Fetus opens up, we might be able to get it there. Obviously, you get these things. I don't know if it's online yet, but definitely put this down as a must read. And not just because it's got Prince in it, but because it's about Minnesota, about music, music business here. It's about Pepe and the life in music that you really dedicated yourself to. I respect that because it's important for us as 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 we move in life to be mentors to younger people and to guide them. And I think there's still people out there for you, Pepe, to do this with. Um, also, I want to thank everybody uh, as it relates to the uh, PRN Alumni Foundation. Yeah. So definitely, that is a foundation that we continue to support. You know. The legacy of Prince and his giving. And that's primarily what we do. So it's prnalumni.org. Uh, you can check that out on our website. I want to thank everybody. Yeah. Me in here, everybody thank helped make this right. Greg Rice, thanks, PRN <laughs> Alumni. Thank the Minnesota Historical Press. Tony, I love you, man. This time I love I'm you too, Pat. Yeah, this has All been right. great. It's been great. I mean, and you know, I'm glad we had a chance to do this, Pepe. You know, you and I are long overdue to do this. I mean, problem is that we're, we're we're busy men, but we have to consider spending some time and and if not here in Vegas, maybe. Yeah. Well, okay. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I love it. It's been great. Thank you. Thank and thanks to the audience for joining us because this doesn't really exist unless the audience is there Absolutely. listening to it. So thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for logging in and mm -hmm. listening to us chat for a while. Yeah, and hopefully this will get recorded. I think I'm pretty sure it will. And if you have an opportunity, please go to the Historic Society's website to, to tap into this and pass it on to your friends because this is, a, and I'm not going to say it's a once in a lifetime. You might have another book in you. <laughs> you might have another book in you. <laughs> what is that book, Tony? What is that book? <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> What's the title? If you, we don't have a title yet. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks very much. Right. Thank, Thank you, Craig. Take care, buddy. All right. Later. <laughs>